Hello, and welcome to this Bitcoin Magazine interview. I am Vlad, and it's hard for me to believe that I'm saying this, but today I will be interviewing the hodler of Last Resort, the original one, and the Babe Ruth of investing. He is Trace Mayer, and uh, he has a lot of interesting stuff to say, so I'll no longer talk. <laughs> well, thanks for having me, Vlad. And uh, you got to guide the conversation somehow. So what are we going to talk about? Yes, sir. So less than a month from now, we'll be having that event, which is all about moving your coins away from exchanges. And I'm not sure if the purpose of it is to move temporarily or to just become financially sovereign and stop trading because it turns out to be a bad idea in the long term. So tell me about Proof of Keys. Yeah, so Proof of Keys, I started uh, the celebration. In it, we assert our monetary sovereignty. If you have rights, but you don't ever flex them, those, your, your muscles are going to get weak. And so with Proof of Keys, what we do is we just withdraw all of our crypto, Bitcoin, Litecoin, uh, Ether, like whatever you got, just withdraw everything from any third party. So from any exchange, from any lending service like BlockFi or, or Celsius, uh, you just withdraw from any third party, any crypto that you have anywhere. And you withdraw to a node uh, that you're running. So you're doing all of your own validation. You're not relying on anybody and where you hold the private keys. Because uh, you really have to have both of those prongs. You have to be running, doing your own validation so you're not trusting, uh, but you're verifying. And then you also have to be holding your own private keys. And that's how you really become a first class Bitcoin citizen. Uh, you know, you're not reliant on anybody. And the reason I started the celebration was we have so many new people that come into the space. Uh, they they didn't lose money in Mt. Gox. I didn't lose money in Mt. Gox, but I watched a lot of other people lose money in Mt. Gox. Uh, they didn't lose money in, you know, a number of all of these hacks that have happened over the years. Uh, and so they don't, they don't necessarily have the ethos. They don't have the experience. They don't have the, the human capital to hold their own private keys. So, you know, proof of keys is a way that annually we can help everybody get up to speed on developing these uh, skills and abilities. And it'll help strengthen the network, you know, because the more decentralized the networks are and decentralized, I mean, economic nodes where people are actually buying transactions that have economic value to them uh, and, and decentralization of people holding private keys. Uh, I, I just tweeted out a report. It showed that like eight exchanges hold 1.9 million Bitcoin. You know, that's, that's a lot. That's over 10% of the total outstanding Bitcoin. Uh, so it centralizes a lot of stuff that way. And there's a lot of risk uh, when, when you have things centralized. And so, you know, this is just a celebration. We get to exert our monetary sovereignty. We get to have a lot of fun. We get to teach new people how to do it because uh, it can be kind of intimidating for new people. And uh, we can just, you know, celebrate that we have this ability, uh, you know, because if we never exercise the ability or we do it, you know, haphazardly, we, you know, we, we kind of, get at risk of kind of taking it for granted and you you know it it's it doesn't really matter until it's the only thing that matters and if you don't have that those skills and those abilities and you need to move quickly for some reason in the space because there's an emergency situation and you want your keys out of an exchange because you're afraid they're insolvent or whatever if you haven't like trained you you know you don't want to be learning and training yourself in an emergency situation. So that's another reason I think this is a good uh, exercise for people to go through. Okay. The post-2017 narrative about being a Bitcoiner is that you need about $200 to buy a full validating node and you need, you need $100 to buy a hardware wallet. And this financial sovereignty comes with the cost of a few items that are part of the Bitcoiner lifestyle to call it like that so how did you old timers do key management before we even had these inventions well first i don't like uh bitcoin specific hardware wallets like ledger like trezors or ledgers uh you know those are you're putting a lot of trust in those companies and they know that you're going to be using that device for bitcoin 
uh, Amazon knows it's in your permanent purchase history. Like, I mean, think about it. Uh, using general purpose hardware uh, to be running your software on, I think that that, uh, you know, you, you have a lot more privacy uh, about what you're using that hardware for. Um, second, I don't know that you need to be spending a couple hundred dollars on a note. I mean, I, I have several old uh, computers and I run Bitcoin full nodes on them. You know, because I've upgraded to get more RAM and more storage and I'm, I got a new computer. So I use an old computer and I run and I can run full nodes on that. In addition, I can run Bitcoin Core on any of my new computers also, you know, and, and be operating that way. And then with Armory, you can you can have your Armory uh, watching only wallet on on your uh, on your new computer. You can have an Armory uh, cold storage wallet on uh, on a computer that you never connect to the internet. And, and now you're not having to spend a couple hundred dollars on specialized hardware that just like get leaks privacy. And, you know, so, so, you know, there isn't a cost, like you, you don't necessarily have to go out and spend a bunch of money and upgrade a bunch of uh, hardware, or purchase hardware. You can use stuff that you've already got, and then you get to hodl more Bitcoin. Uh, so, you know that that's kind of one of the one of the things there, and and I think it's important for people to learn how to understand a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, like using Armory versus a Ledger or a Trezor, because you get much more granular uh, control there. It's really a Swiss Army knife. You can you can have multiple wallets. You can control the UTXOs in each in, in each of those wallets. Um, you know, all of that is you know just you're you're upgrading your ability to interact with the Bitcoin network when you do that. So, you know, I, I'd kind of take issue. I don't think people need to be worried about spending hundreds of dollars on new hardware uh, just to do this. Not that that's necessarily a bad idea. It's just, I like using general purpose hardware because then the people I bought the hardware from don't necessarily know what I intend to use it for. So you know, the, the random number generator might, you know, I, it's less likely to be compromised. And even if it is compromised, it's less likely that the person I bought it from would know that I'm going to be using it for Bitcoin. And because of that, that, that compromised random number generator, they're able to compromise the seeds, for example. Because uh, there are a lot of attacks uh, to Bitcoin besides just on the hardware device itself. Um, you know, you, you can you, you can have these other kind of soft attacks, uh, you could say. So, you know, that and everybody's going to be interacting a different way. And that's part of what the celebration is for, is for us to learn best practices from everybody and have discussion about it. There is also this dimension of hardware wallets that isn't discussed too much. Because when you buy a ledger, for example, you will be using their validating nodes when you send your funds to the address that generates, that is generated on your device. So you don't connect your own node. You have to rely on some kind of third party and they're going to know your IP address unless you use some kind of VPN or Tor routing. And they will be able to associate your transactions with your identity. And yeah, I think that in the future, there will be a market for this kind of information. Well, there already is a market for this type of information. The IRS is buying lots of uh, lots of this data from companies like Chainalysis and CypherTrace, uh, you know, and and Coinbase and and other and some of these other exchanges are actively selling uh, user data and information to these types of companies, you know, because it's a way to make some extra money and the customers are just to be harvested. Uh, Kraken has a strict no sharing of information policy, uh, but that but Kraken still has your information. I would rather people and companies not even have my information in the first place. And, you know, another issue is that ledger or Trezor could be uniquely identifiable, even if you buy it for cash or buy it off of Amazon, right? Because maybe it's got a serial number and when it reports back home, it lets that serial number be known. And then when you're querying the balances of different addresses, because you're not running your own node or connecting to your own node with it, uh, assuming that they, they allow that type of behavior to even happen, 
um, yeah, you're leaking all types of information. You're leaking the IP address. If it was bought on Amazon, you've now leaked the shipping address of where you, you have the thing shipped to. And I mean, think put, put on your, your criminal hat, right? Like if you want to figure out uh, where to go find some Bitcoins, like go compromise Led Ledger or Trezor's database, figure out all of their users, sort by the users that have the most Bitcoin and go get them. I mean, like it's not, it's not very difficult, right? Um, and, and you know that, that because they're using the Ledger or Trezor, you know the particular type of security procedures or processes that are likely uh, around, uh, around that, you know, that, that they're using. Uh, for example, like, you know, when you're using Armory and you've got fragmented backups and seeds, you can have those distributed in multiple different safety deposit boxes all over the world. Uh, you, you could have different procedures in order to even access them like you and, and certain other people have to be physically with you to get into the safety deposit box in Singapore or in Switzerland or wherever. So, you know, you can build a lot more flexibility around uh, around your the, the actual generation and, and security of the keys when you're using a, a all-purpose tool like Armory, uh, for example. And so, you know, these are things that people should be aware of because guess what? Like Ledger and Trezor, they're not going to tell you that they're doing this or that, or that they're potentially weak in this area. And guess what? The people that have like advertising agreements or are earning commissions from Ledger or Trezor – they're not gonna they're not gonna talk about this right like why would they talk about this it goes against their financial interests and and so you know you you to to really find good signal in this space that's not compromised uh by financial motive i think is a very difficult thing to do and so proof of keys is a is an annual time or celebration where we get to drag out all of these types of things uh, into the public sphere and, and debate and talk about it. I think this is yet another underrated argument for proof of keys and against holding your funds on exchanges because maybe that they are secure and unlike Mt. Gox, they are not holding their funds in some sort of Excel document that can be extracted and they have some sort of very advanced cryptography that will not be cracked in 100 years or something, but they have private data of their users. And sometimes, just like Binance did, they will be resorting to the services of some other third-party data processor that is very vulnerable. And they can hack this user data and then blackmail the exchange and try to extort an amount of Bitcoins. And even if they don't succeed in this, they will be exposing your private data. And that's not something that you want everyone to see, how much Bitcoin you own, what kind of transactions you're making, and everything else associated with your financial identity. Yeah, and and you know, with Bitcoin at seventy five hundred dollars, it's different than like Bitcoin at a hundred thousand dollars, right? And so you got to be thinking ahead, also, because uh, you know, when Bitcoin was five dollars or or two hundred dollars, you know, a lot of people didn't think ahead like this, and now we're at seventy five hundred dollar Bitcoin. So you need to be extremely careful with the exchanges that you use, the way that you interact with them, the data that you're you're leaking to them, that they're required by law in many cases to get like AML, KYC compliance, stuff like that. Um, you know, you just, you, you got to be very careful. And remember, Bitcoin is an immutable blockchain. So those transactions are there permanently, right? And, and so... Like if you're leaking data, IP addresses or email accounts or uh, passport scans, all this stuff that get attached to different Bitcoin uh, UTXOs, you know, that and then get shared around with other companies in the space that are doing that, you know, because Chainalysis is probably sharing Coinbase's data with Bitstamp and Bitstamp with Coinbase, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, just you got to be careful and, and be aware of that and that there that it's an immutable blockchain like all those transactions are there permanently and you know i i like to operate on a principle of least privilege and a principle of least information meaning that i give the least amount of information possible 
And I also like to give the least amount of access or privilege uh, as possible uh, to any of these exchanges or, or, or other, or other or operators. And, you know, so because if the data, if you never give up the data in the first place, then it can't get hacked and like spread around, right? Because you never gave it up. So, you know, I think just changing your mindset and thinking in these types of a way, like how can, you know, how can I reduce the attack surface or the attack vector? Um, a lot of that is just not having the stuff out there in the first place. And so, you know, that, that's another thing that comes out of this proof of keys uh, discussion, because, you know, a lot of these podcasts and a lot of the, the trading videos and, and interviews and stuff that people do, they make money. You know, they make money from companies that effectively are gathering and selling data, like because they, they have to gather all this data for AML KYC purposes and they figure might as well sell it. Right. Like the lending services. I mean, how are they how are they paying out eight uh, percent and and only earning six percent on the coins? Well, it's because they're selling data too, most likely, or they're just trying or it's not their money. So they're not really uh, figuring out how good of a credit risk uh, the people that they're lending coins to really are. So, you know, all and, and when you demand back your Bitcoin from the lending services, you're going to find out whether they actually have them or not. When you demand it from the exchanges, you're going to find out whether they're actually going to send them or not. You know, that's very important stuff to learn, very important information. And you don't learn it until you actually try to enforce it. When you actually say, give me my Bitcoin right now, that's when you learn whether they're going to send it to you or not. And it's very binary. Well, my is next what it question is. for you would be about being a newbie in the space and not knowing anything about financial sovereignty and possibly buying like $500 worth of Bitcoin on Coinbase. And I, I want to participate in Proof of Keys next month. So what kind of tools should I use for this type of financial sovereignty? How do I get there? Well, you know, it's running your own full node and, and taking your cybersecurity very carefully. Uh, if you're, you know, with $500, you don't really have a lot at risk. Uh, when you have $500, you can put $500 a thought into securing it. When you have $500,000 or $5 million, you need to put more, more thought into securing it. So with $500, the Bitcoin core software is a full node and you hold your own private keys. And they've tried to build it to be very secure and very robust and it's free. So as long as you have enough space on your computer, you can run it for free. And so, you know, maybe start there, withdraw 25 or $50, see if like that meets your risk tolerance. The thing with proof of keys is that there's the absolute best that you can do. And then there's everything else in between. And everybody has to make that value or that judgment decision on their own of how much risk they're willing to take because you're, you're awfully, usually you're, you're sacrificing security for convenience. And so, you know, how do you, how do you weigh that off? Do you really want to be flying all over the world, getting multiple fragments put together in order to move $50 of Bitcoin? Like that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but to move like $500 million of Bitcoin, like some of these exchanges would need to move, then it would make sense. So, you know, if you're new into this space, think about it as learning how to use the new technology. You figured out how to do a to and a from address in email. You figured out a subject line. Then you figured out how to type the paragraph. Then you figured out how to attach files to it. Sometimes you got limits, like you could only attach a file that was a certain size or smaller. Well, guess what? You have AML KYC limits, you have withdrawal limits, you have all these types of different, different things that you're gonna have to deal with and grapple with in learning how to use the Bitcoin technology and how to interact with the other companies and individuals in the space that are using it. And there's really no substitute for just getting on the bicycle and riding it. And guess what? You might fall and scrape your knee. Okay, get up, get back on the bicycle. You know, if you, uh, and, and start out, you know, kind of small. You, you have no business allocating more capital to Bitcoin than you can afford to lose. And one thing that we've found is that when you trust third parties, 
you will eventually be disappointed and they'll lose their money for you. Like that's kind of a golden rule in Bitcoin. It's just, you can't trust these third parties. They become massive honeypots. There's a lot of value to be stolen there. You know, not just the crypto value and not just the USD or Euro value in their bank accounts, but all the data also that's there to be stolen. So, you know, you gotta, you gotta kind of just figure this all out on your own. I mean, at least we have proof of keys where we generate some of the discussion. Otherwise, you just remain ignorant. And man, the price for being ignorant in the crypto space is really, really expensive. Right now, I'm thinking about Bitcoin Core as a very important tool for financial sovereignty. But are there any others that you recommend to anyone from newbies to advanced investors? Yeah, I mentioned Bit Bitcoin Core. I mentioned Armory. Uh, nice cold storage wallet. It runs on the Bitcoin Core node. So you do all your own validation, uh, but you get more features in the wallet itself. Uh, and hopefully Bitcoin Core will develop a lot of those features, uh, you know, but it takes time and money to write code and test it and deploy it. And they're really focused more on the network consensus anyways, not the private key uh, security. Uh, so there's Bitcoin Core, there's Armory. I like Purism laptops because you can have them not even with a Wi-Fi card at all. And your entire stack is much cleaner than like a Windows or a, a Mac stack. Uh, your, you know, your operating system, your boot, your BIOS, like all this type of stuff. Um, and then there are a couple guides out there. Uh, there's the Glacier Protocol, glacierprotocol.org. It's like a 90 page uh, open source guide that people put together for best security practices. There's another one called smartcustody.com uh, by Christopher Allen, another you know, kind of free open source community project to help people figure out how to have the policies and procedures to secure private keys. Uh, but I mean, keep in mind, like your monetary sovereignty is for you to claim. And everybody else, they want to chip away at your monetary sovereignty and sell it and make money, right? So, like, there's not really anybody who's got a financial incentive or, or reason to help you claim your monetary sovereignty. Most just want to enslave you via debt in the fiat monetary system. And a lot of them have brought a lot of those bad practices into Bitcoin, rehypothecation, fractional reserving, uh, no audited financial statements and stuff of that nature, uh, not proving that they have the coins like on the blockchains with signed messages and stuff, not letting you, pr not pr letting you prove that your balances are actually there. Uh, the, the last time Kraken did a proof of reserves audit was years and years ago. Um, you know, and, and, and I consider Kraken one of the good actors in the space. They at least have done a proof of reserves audit once, you know, most, most exchanges and companies out there haven't even done one or even tried to do one. So you, you just have to keep that in mind. Like most people and most businesses do not want you to exercise your monetary sovereignty. They want to keep you weak. They want to keep you enslaved and they don't want you to have your own keys and your own price and your own coins. So, you know, finding signal in this space, Finding a voice that you that, that is actually giving out good information is a very, very hard thing to do. And there are a lot of financial currents running against signal being provided. Um, so, you know, that's another thing for people to keep in mind. I'm actually surprised that you haven't mentioned anything about Electrum or Wasabi that are some of the most popular open source software that allow you to connect your node and manage your funds. Yeah, I I just don't uh, I don't I use Armory. I don't really use Wasabi or Electrum. I use Bitcoin Core. Uh, there are a lot more eyeballs on Bitcoin Core, uh, and you know I'm not really interested in engaging in a bunch of coin join transactions because that just further complicates like the AML KYC situation. And I know that my Bitcoins are clean. So why would I want to mix them with somebody whose Bitcoins are dirty? You know, so all of this AML KYC 
data also impinges on the fungibility of, of, of the Satoshis themselves. Uh, so, you know, that's another thing to keep in mind. Like you can't just go going around, like sticking your Bitcoin and anything that moves, like you might catch something bad. Uh, and then you become a person of interest in the criminal investigation. And why do you want law enforcement like looking into you? Right. So, you know, you've got to be careful uh, how you acquire your Bitcoin, how like how you interact with them, like with coin joining and all this type of stuff uh, on Wasabi, the exchanges that you use, the people you trade with, um, you know, all of that, like, you know, there's just a lot to kind of be careful of. And so, um, and, and now there's, I mean, there's hundreds of exchanges and there's tons of wallets out there. And, and I mean, is there really enough time to be re doing thorough review on all of these wallets? I mean, I'm not going to talk about something that I haven't found to be trustworthy myself, you know, like, um, so, you know, that's another thing to, to keep in mind. I, I'm sure that there are plenty of wallets out there that are intentionally compromised by the developers so that they can steal people's Bitcoins and other crypto. I mean, that, that would be a phenomenal business model if you, if you lack the morals or the ethics. You know, get a nice wallet out there and then when, when people are storing enough Bitcoin in there, just start swiping it, you know? So, um, you know, you gotta, you really have to think adversarially and that everybody's out to get you. They're trying to chip away your monetary sovereignty. They're trying to steal your Bitcoins. They're trying to sell your personal data and information. Like you need to be highly, highly skeptical uh, and just don't trust, verify. Um, very cypherpunk ethos. That's a very interesting theory that you have about coin joints because people like Greg Maxwell or Adam Back pretty much appreciate this idea of mixing your coins and therefore acquiring fungibility to this chain of unknowledgeable transactions. You don't know where that comes from. Nobody really can do the type of analysis which breaks the, the anonymity set that Wasabi or Samurai have built. And the general idea behind it is that if everybody does it, then nobody will be able to track any more transactions, which means that Bitcoin acquires its fungibility. Well, I mean, that's incredibly naive uh, to think that particular way. I mean, if you were to draft laws that a hardware last resort wanted to protect property rights and all this stuff, that's what we've done in Wyoming. We've tried to push the ball down the field and acquire as much monetary sovereignty legal under the legal code as we can. But guess what they're not budging on? They're not going to budge on any AML, KYC, BSA, counter-terrorist financing, sanctions type uh, transactions, right? So when you engage in a coin join, you don't know who the other people are in that, in that, in that ring, right? And so... If you've got clean Bitcoin, why would you want to taint those Bitcoins by coin joining them with someone who you don't know whether those Bitcoins are clean or not? Because you're, you're, you're giving away value and because there's more value in clean Bitcoins than dirty Bitcoins. Because dirty Bitcoins, you might get arrested by a SWAT team and potentially shot or thrown in jail like Ross Albert. Right. So like clean Bitcoins are superior to dirty Bitcoins. And th this is part of a flaw or a bug just in the way Bitcoin is designed and constructed, because you have a permanent immutable blockchain and all the transactions and amounts in UTXOs are publicly available for all of this type of chain analysis and other stuff like that. And so thinking that you're going to acquire fungibility because you're engaging in things like coin join is incredibly naive. You, you want to know what's really going to happen with that? The, the Bank Secrecy Act with the AML KYC, it, it requires a risk-based approach. And so when Bitcoins come in that are coin joined, 
versus Bitcoins that come in that are clear that they came from Coinbase. Like say I'm depositing into Kraken and, I, and, I, and I'm depositing into Kraken Bitcoins that I got from Coinbase. And Kraken knows that those are coming from Coinbase because they can see them like come out of Coinbase's wallet and then go into Kraken, right? Very clean, very clear. If, and so, Crack, so, so Kraken's able to look at that and say, that's a very low risk transaction for AML source of funds compliance. If I send in a coin join that came from a coin join, that came from a coin join, that came from a coin join, guess what? That is now a greater risk versus the coins that came from Coinbase. So guess what Kraken's compliance officer has to do? What do you think? They'll just freeze the funds or something and then... No, change. no, they... They, 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 they won't just freeze the funds like right off the bat. I mean, they, they, they'll freeze the funds if there's reason to freeze the funds. But just because it's a coin join doesn't necessarily mean that there's reason to freeze the funds. But I mean, put yourself in the position of one of these chief compliance officers or one of the subordinates that's analyzing these incoming transactions. And you have a whole bunch of coin joins. And if you if you don't file the suspicious activity report, the SAR, uh, you could potentially go to jail, right? Like that's why Charlie Shrim went to jail because he was like being a chief compliance officer and not complying with chief compliance officer duties. So you know, and and you if you're going to be a centralized third party like one of these exchanges, like we can't expect them to fight the fungibility and the privacy fight for us. That's that's a fight to be fought in the political square, not on the companies. Just don't use the companies if you if you don't want to deal with that, you know, and try to cash out your Bitcoin via cash and potentially get nabbed uh, like a lot of the local Bitcoin sellers have done. But think think about it. You, you, you're the chief compliance officer. Or you're a compliance officer at one of these exchanges, and a and a transaction comes in that's been coin joined through the last ten transactions over over a period of three to six months. Like, what do you do? What do you do with that versus like a transaction that's coming in from Coinbase? I mean, how do you behave? You can't. I mean, if you just freeze the account right off the bat, like, I, I don't know that that's necessarily going to work, because law enforcement might actually want that that transaction to get processed normally, right? Because they want to see how that behavior is happening in order to further their investigation. See what I'm saying? Yeah, but at the same time, when you make any Bitcoin transaction, you're not just exposing how much Bitcoin you own, but how much Bitcoin the people who sent you those Bitcoins actually own. And there's a long chain of revealing financial information. It's like telling how much Bitcoin people are holding in their wallets. And that's why a lot of engineers have such a great opinion about coin joins and mixing as a general idea. Well, yeah, but, but, but you, okay. So you gain a little bit of privacy and fungibility at the expense of raising your risk profile for AML KYC compliance reasons, right? So now your account's getting more scrutiny applied to it. Yeah. But you know, Unless you're depositing to exchanges, there is never going to be any kind of issue with this. Oh, I mean, use local bitcoins; they're going to pick you up. You know, if you're dealing in cash as a as a money transmitter. I mean, you think you think Ross Albrecht was using exchanges? He's sitting in he's sitting in the federal pen for life without the opportunity for parole because he lost his appeal. Like he's done, he's gonna die in jail unless there's a presidential pardon. That's the only way he'll get out. And he wasn't using exchanges. And they used a ton of blockchain analytics in that trial. I, I attended two thirds of that trial. I, I was there for, for the entire day for two weeks out of the, out of the three week trial. And they, they were extensive on the blockchain analytics as for making the case. And and he wasn't using centralized third parties, except for himself, right? So what is your opinion on confidential transactions in Bitcoin? 
Well, I mean, this is part of the problem. Like we have to, like, what is more important, limited and amountness or the privacy and fungibility? And that's kind of just a fundamental trade-off because of how the math works and, that, and where the proofs are at, the mathematical proofs. And for the first network effect of speculation, I think that limited and amountness is more important. And I also think limited and amountness is more important for reclaiming monetary sovereignty than the privacy and fungibility is. Um, but that doesn't mean that the privacy and fungibility are not important. And it also doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to take territory wherever we can with that. Now, the problem, as I see it with Bitcoin, is we've got an immutable blockchain. We've got addresses and we've got amounts. And so, you know, things like Mimblewimble, when that paper came out in 2016, uh, there's a lot of excitement about Mimblewimble because we're able to have the data or the information not even appear there in the first place. And I think that's more important. One, it needs to be, uh, if, if you're going to try to get the privacy and the anonymity and the fungibility, it needs to be there in the base layer for everybody. And it can't be opt-in. I look at Zcash. All the exchanges that support Zcash require you to send it in unblinded. So you have to opt out, you know, you have to opt in to the, the privacy or the fungibility, but you have to make sure that you're opted out of it whenever you interact with the exchanges. And so what, what ends up happening? You have, a, you, you have a very small set of people that are actually using it for the, the, the privacy and fungibility. And if there are three out of 100 people that are wearing a mask, it's pretty easy to apply more scrutiny and figure out who those three people are. But if 100 out of 100 people are wearing a mask, it's a lot more difficult because everybody's doing that. And so that's one thing. Two is if you can not even have the data appear in the first place, I think that's very important. And so that's why I like things like Lightning Network and Onion Routing and stuff like that. But even with Onion Routing, like look at what the federal government has done with Tor. They just operate a lot of the Tor exit nodes. So you could have a similar type of thing happen uh, with Lightning Network nodes. And, and so Mimblewimble, you know, could potentially uh, be helpful with that. Um, you know, and, and even better if you could have Mimblewimble and then put that into a Lightning Network type of situation. Uh, but, you know, taking our monetary sovereignty in terms of privacy and fungibility, I think that's, that's another fight. I don't know that we're going to get much support from a lot of the actors and economic interests that are now in Bitcoin because it's such a political hot button issue. Look, I mean, look at FAFT, like the, the Financial Action Task Force, you know, rolling out the new uh, vast uh, virtual asset service provider rules and requiring compliance with the travel rule, knowing where it came from, where, where it went to. Um, you know, there's just gonna be so much political pressure on these centralized third parties and so much economic value and liquidity happening in Bitcoin that changing that status quo, it could end up probably being more contentious than SegWit activation was. You know, getting things like Schnorr Signature, Taproot, Graphroot, and, uh, and, and these other types of uh, privacy enhancements uh, rolled in. So, so I think, you know, we ought to be realistic and pragmatic uh, in our approach here and not be naive and think that just because we're able to acquire greater fungibility at a technical level, that doesn't necessarily mean that we've acquired it at a legal level or under the legal code. And in fact, we might acquire more at the technical level and that results in, in getting less at the legal level. I'm really happy that we started this privacy conversation and I wish we could go on, but I know you have another interview. So I will ask you in the ending of this interview about that tweet in which you mentioned that there should be a, an airdrop reward for those who participate in the Proof of Keys event. Are you still sticking to that idea? Yeah, I mean, I think that would be great because one, like when, 
whenever you create these airdrops, they don't really, what we found is they don't really cost the Bitcoin holder anything. Uh, and yet you get an asset. And if that asset has any value at all, you can always sell it and get more Bitcoin, right? But if we had some type of a, you know, and, and this is, I haven't really put a ton of thought into this idea with a, with a proof of keys type airdrop. But if we could use a, a proof of keys airdrop to, to squeeze value out of the exchanges, then th that don't provide the keys, for example, then that would be a way that, you know, we could, we could even perhaps make some money because you're effectively, um, the, the exchanges that are short, the actual physical Bitcoin, uh, they don't get the airdrop. And so if you do get the airdrop and and you're able to squeeze the price of it because there's not very much supply of it, then you're able to create, you know, these uh, potential liabilities for the exchanges because it's like, well, why didn't you why didn't you support this thing? It's worth, you know, ten dollars now. <laughs> and I had buy 500 coins on exchange where's my five thousand dollars, <laughs> you know, and, and so. That, that's what I would be looking at it as more being able to uh, use, use the airdrop as a way to squeeze, uh, squeeze the third parties that don't participate or support the proof of keys. Um, you know, that, that's one thing. The, the other thing is like these airdrops and these forks, they're, they're, I think they're great. You know, they're, you're able to, uh, you're able to, find buyers for these things. Um, look at Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Gold and, and a lot of these forks. Uh, and so I don't think Bitcoin holders, I don't think they should have anything to fear uh, from, you know, airdrops and forks, like all the better. And, and they can also act as very good test beds and very good test nets. Uh, for example, Segregated Witness got activated on Lightning Network first before it got activated on Bitcoin. And we saw over a few months that it didn't really, there, there were no security vulnerabilities that got uh, exploited. So, you know, that's, a, that's another way that, that these airdrops and forks are nice is they can act as test beds um, for, for new features. And so, you know, I think, and, and plus, you know, the more forks and airdrops that are out there, like let's, let's keep raising the cost on these chain analysis companies, right? Because like the more of them that are out there, the more they have to support. And Chainalysis just laid off like 39 people. So like we don't necessarily know how profitable it is to be doing all this spying on, on people. But why don't we just increase the amount of stuff that they have to track and monitor uh, so that it raises their costs? Uh, so, you know, there. I think there's, I, I don't think a hodler of Bitcoin and, and even someone who's a Bitcoin maximalist, I don't think they should have anything to fear from forks and airdrops. And the more of these, the better, in my opinion, because it raises the cost on the chain analysis companies, uh, which, you know, the, more, the, the less money they can make, the better. Like we want them to be very unprofitable so that they don't get funded uh, and so that they aren't uh, good investments. Um, you know, and so that's another another potential attack I think we can we can exert by uh by holding our own private keys. And, and it's, you know, there, there's a lot of stuff we need to do here. Back in 2015, I did an interview about removing the smell of Bitcoin because uh, the Swiss have a saying that gold has no smell. And that's because when you take a gold bar and you melt it down and you recast it, all of that previous history with that gold bar is destroyed, Immute, like gone, right? Uh, because you, you've got atoms, but that, that audit history is gone. There's no way to destroy the history of Satoshis uh, in the Bitcoin network. And so if we can find a way to uh, destroy uh, some of that history in a way that's still computationally sound when it comes to the limited amountness of the coins, I think that's a fruit that that's a field ripe for a uh, ripe for innovation. Uh, this privacy uh, area, because that's it's essential for us to have that to take our monetary sovereignty. Uh, but it's more important to have limited amountness. But it's also very important to have have the privacy, the anonymity, the fungibility, uh, and of course 
other things that go along with what we're working on, like scalability and other, other solutions. So, you know, I find that all very important um, stuff to do. And if we, if we're not continually learning and continually developing in our skills and our ability and our human capital, then we we get very stagnant. And that's another thing that airdrops and forks can do is they can financially incentivize uh, developing different forms of human capital. You know, being able to secure your own private keys and and running full nodes and uh, securely signing messages for airdrop claiming and, and all this type of stuff. You know, that's all technical ability and human capital and, and airdrops and forks uh, help people develop that and become more literate in crypto uh, asset technology. So I think all of that is very good because we, in my opinion, I, I want people to know exactly what they're buying, exactly why they're buying it. I want them to have as much knowledge and information and ability and skill as possible because that makes them stronger. Right. And, and I want people to be strong, not weak. And what's the way you can be the strongest? Uh, one of them is to have your monetary sovereignty, you know, that gives you just a, 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 a real spine in your back because you have, you have monetary sovereignty. So, you know, all of that's just, in my opinion, it is very important. So hopefully we'll, we'll continue developing all that type of stuff uh, as, a, as a community and treating monetary sovereignty as a, as a very important characteristic uh, and something to be appreciated and jealously guarded. Mr. Mayor, I'm very happy and privileged that we got to have this interview. And I, I feel like I have learned a lot from you during this hour. So thank you very much. And maybe that next year when you have this proof of keys event or maybe sooner than that, we get to talk again and maybe update our views regarding to privacy or whatever happens in Bitcoin. Yeah, th thanks so much. Hopefully we don't have too much collateral damage. Uh, last year, Quadriga CX failed after proof of keys. A couple hundred million dollars of uh, lost customer funds. It's too sad, too sad for them. They should have uh, proved their keys a little bit earlier. Uh, so anyways, thanks so much for having me. Uh, you know, have my Bitcoin podcast, have my Twitter uh, where people can follow. Thanks so much for, uh, for the interview.